very good evening and welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news here on CNC3. I'm Rhea Rambley. Kamal Georges has the evening off. Lasselli was making the news tonight. Massive manhunt underway for missing two-year-old boy. Search crews are tonight combing the Point Fortin area. National Security Minister admits crime situation horrendous but sees no reason to resign. After damning report into children's residences, Division of Aging now inspecting elderly homes. Good evening, I'm Ryan Beju. Here's what's coming up in sport. Fitness comes into focus once more as Evan Lewis fails to make the West Indies squad for the Netherlands and Pakistan tours. I'm Kalyan Hussain and our first tropical wave for the 2022 Atlantic hurricane season has moved off the African coast. What does this mean for Trinidad and Tobago? I'll have the details in tonight's weather forecast. We begin with news tonight. Rescue groups, police and volunteers are at this time searching for a missing two-year-old boy. The toddler walked away from his Point Fortin home this morning and has not been seen since. As reporter Jesse Ramdeo and cameraman Ivan Tulsi tell us, the boy's disappearance has left the entire borough shocked. However, hope remains that he's found safe and alive. The Lord, we give you praise and thanks for bringing us out together, Lord, as a team, one team of different groups coming together collectively. We pray that we will get good results, Lord, and the child, we pray that the child is safe right now as we speak. It's a rallying call for divine intervention in what is now considered one of the largest search exercises in Point Fortin's recent history. It follows the vanishing of two-year-old Kamani Francis after he wandered away from his home here in Tishi village. Neighbors reportedly saw the barefooted toddler walking along the road and contacted the police. But soon after, they lost sight of the little boy and an alarm was raised, prompting scores of residents and even people beyond the borough to comb the community in search of him. You know, I'm doing a little search here under the bridge here because plenty of debris under the bridge and, you know, anything possible, anything. But we here just help the family. Among those on the scene, members of the Hunter's Search and Rescue team. Leader Ran Gobi Singh said the operation to find the toddler was expansive. Volunteers from the group Extreme Hunters also lent their assistance in locating little Kamani. They said the boy like water, so this is where we, the first thing we check in is the name of us. And we did our good search, we went all the way around. We were by down to the floodgate, back around, right, and we come back to this point. Point 14's Mayor Slima Thomas said even in spite of all efforts, bolder moves should have been taken to ensure the child's safe return. We should have locked down point. From the time we get in news, we should have locked down point and start doing some proper searches along the way. The child's parents were also among the groups searching for him at various locations. Jesse Ramde, OCNC 3 News. Attorneys and relatives of prisoners are being extorted by inmates. That's according to Acting Prisons Commissioner Deo Pasad Ramuta. At a National Security Ministry press conference this afternoon, Acting Commissioner Ramuta said that he's received complaints that people are being blackmailed and threatened. He said when new prisoners come into the prison system, seasoned criminals give them phones to call relatives, and that's when the extortion begins. And now the criminal elements have their phone numbers. They would call them and persuade them to bring money for them through various channels. And if they don't, they will hurt their loved ones in prison. The acting commissioner called on the public to use the legal channels to contact inmates. Meanwhile, he confirmed that 18 officers were arrested over the last two years for attempting to traffic drugs and contraband into the prisons. Two officers were arrested for the year thus far, with two more expected to be taken into police custody later this week. Now, after calls from citizens and the business community for meaningful action against crime, National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines is promising to deliver. At a national security meeting earlier today, Hines admitted that the country's crime situation is horrendous, but he's confident that national security services will turn the situation around. Joshua Simongal has the details. 
With at least 193 homicides as of Monday, the pressure is building on National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines to gain control of the crime situation. It's a situation he described in his own words today as mind-blowing and crazy. Although he calls the crime fight complex, he is confident that through partnership with the national security agencies, the spike can be reversed. I would like to take this opportunity to say to the business community who spoke out, admirably so, I would like to take this opportunity to say to all of Trinidad and Tobago, we share your pain, we share the trauma, and the men and women of law enforcement who are sworn and paid to protect you are on the job. When asked, Minister Hines says he has not considered stepping down from his post. He says he's been putting in the work and is determined to address issues as they arise. Have you considered resignation given the horrendous situation of crime? Well, the answer to your question is no. I know what my responsibilities are. My Prime Minister knows what my responsibility as one of his ministers are. He's the one to judge. I don't think so. Police Commissioner MacDonald Jacob says more officers will be on patrol in the coming days. However, he says that approach will not work in isolation. He says the service has been taking steps to improve detection to take criminals and guns off the streets. As an example, he says 14 automatic fingerprint detectors were purchased and local DNA testing has resumed. We recognize that some of the criminals are intent on continuing their activities and we call it adaptation. So our ballistic center is one of the key that will help us propel our detection rate and, and take some of these offenders from off the street. Of the 193 murders, 32% were attributed to gang activity, 17% to drug-related matters, 13% to armed robberies, and 15% to domestic violence and altercations. Josh Fuzimungal, CNC3 News. A mere hours before the National Security Press Conference, the Confederation of Regional Business Chambers called for more to be done to reduce crime across the country. Vivek Charan's call follows yesterday's shooting incident at a bar in Kanupia, where four people were injured. The head of the Confederation believes the TTPS needs to be more proactive in its approach to crime fighting. How often do the police actually intervene at the point of conflict? where the bandits and, and, and the people intervene. And, and the reality situation is very rarely so, if at all. There's always the aftermath, or there's always the prevention before. And yes, we all need to prevent as much as possible. CCTV cameras, we have to be aware of sur surroundings. Some of us can afford uh, security and so on. Uh, now it's a trend you're seeing in residential areas. You drive around and you see people building, you know, higher walls and so on, putting out money now to raise the level of their walls because everybody's afraid. So we need to talk about other than lethal, you know, lethal forms of self-defense. What about non-lethal forms of self-defense? Charon says it is time for the national security minister to also step up. We have to ask respectfully that the minister of national security get involved. We can't keep everything upon the lap of the commissioner of police. I understand the, 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 the portfolio of national security may not always trickle down to what is the responsibility of the COP. I understand about separating government from the police. I understand all of these things. But at this particular time when we're looking for solutions and really and truly Trinidad doesn't have to worry about uh, a, a, a hostile foreign power rolling in here with tanks and so on at that level of national security. Yes, we may have concerns about terrorism and stuff like that. But generally looking at what is happening now on the ground, we would like to see the presence and the leadership of the Minister of National Security to come to the fore and come to the fore with solutions. Mr. Charon was speaking on CNC3's Morning Brew program today. The opposition leader, Kamala Prasad Bisesa, is again calling for National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines to resign. Her call comes after a quote in a daily newspaper by Minister Hines suggesting that some sexual assault victims are profiting from their victimhood. He also claimed that there are some victims who are even making deals with criminals. Basad Bisasa said sexual assault and rape are serious crimes that should never be callously dismissed. She believes the minister is totally unfit and unprepared for his job and has crossed the line. The opposition leader called on the prime minister to act responsibly and fire Minister Hines.
Well, still to come in the news, Islamic group condemns desecration of Hindu place of worship. We'll tell you what's being done to cleanse the temple. Son of government minister pleads not guilty to allegedly breaking the law. And coming up later on in sport, Ben Martin finds success in the Southlands at the St. Madeline Gulf Open. We've got highlights later in sport. Welcome back. The Sanatan Dharma Mahasabha is seeking to cleanse the Karapo Shiv Mandir, which was desecrated over the weekend. And it's inviting all pundits and devotees to join them at the temple on Thursday as they perform rites and rituals to reinstate sanctity to the place of worship. CNC3 News was told that 5,000 mantras will be chanted on that day. On Friday evening, bandits broke into the temple and not only robbed it, but cooked corned beef in pots used to make a religious offering called Parsad. The Mahasabha calls the act shameless and heinous and demonic, but asked devotees to allow natural justice to prevail. The necessary religious ceremony will take place at 3 p.m. And the Islamic Dawah movement of Trinidad and Tobago is condemning the recent desecration of houses of worship over the weekend, the Karapo Shiv Mandir was robbed and vandalized, but this is the third place of worship to have been desecrated in recent weeks. The pastoral center of the St. Francis R.C. Church in Belmont was also vandalized, while a mosque in Dago Martin was ransacked during the search for the killer of P.C. Clarence Jilks in Rich Plain. The group is praying that this type of attack does not become a trend, the Islamic Dawah movement said. These sacrilegious, sacrilegious attacks are outrageous and disgraceful. After a damning report on aced abuse at several children's homes, there's an assurance tonight that homes for the elderly are under the microscope. The Social Development Minister Donna Cox tells CNC3 News that the Ministry's Division of Aging has been inspecting elderly homes. Minister Cox said the division began probing homes last year but given the findings of the children's report, she has asked the division to hand over a copy of their findings thus far. Well, of course, it's important that, especially when you're hearing all this is happening concerning children's home. Um, yes, we have been um, keeping an eye on the elderly homes. And of course, we will indeed start an investigation on some of these homes to look into them. But our Division of Aging has been working together with some homes and has been doing inspections of homes. And therefore, we will be looking closely at those reports as they come in. Now, the minister could not say how many homes have been inspected thus far or when the probe will be completed. She, however, noted that legislation is coming soon to protect the elderly. This time we are also reviewing the legislation with regards to elderly homes. So that will also help us to be able to, you know, if something happens, you know, that we can take action quickly and so on. So we are reviewing legislation. The minister advised anyone with information about ill treatment or abuse at homes for the aged to contact the Division of Aging or their elderly hotline at 800 OPIC. Meanwhile, the Gender and Child Affairs Minister is under fire for what is being described as her delayed response to the Judith Jones Task Force report into child support centers. Chairman of the Caribbean Committee Against Sex Crimes, Jonathan Bagan, said Minister Ayanna Webster Roy waited too long to present the report given its alarming findings. The report pointed to widespread child physical and sexual abuse across several residences and child support centers, which even led to the deaths of minors. While police investigations have since been launched into the operations at the homes, Bagan said the minister needed to have acted hastily in response to the damning report. The relevant minister sat on that report for five months since um, December of 2021, and it only broke a few weeks ago in Parliament. And that is unacceptable. So citizens have to hold politicians accountable. So right now, um, children who are survivors of trafficking have to go into that children's home system. So, um, and of course, if they're not protected properly, the same traffickers will find them there and, and continue to abuse them. So we do need a lot of investment to protect all children in children's homes. Bagan urged citizens to pressure those in authority to improve their response times to matters of national interest. 
Meanwhile, Bagan maintained that senior officials continue to fuel the human trafficking trade in this country. He said the time has come to stop turning a blind eye as it is contributing rapidly to societal decay. A lot of people in the police service, a lot of high-ranking individuals and businessmen in the country are behind the trafficking trade in Trinidad and regionally. Over 82% of Trinidad's demand for human trafficking is local. So we have a bunch of local perverts. Some of them will be buying the underage girls, like 16 and 15 and 12, who um, some of them, you know, there's a lot of local demand. We're not really a sex tourism destination. Bagan was speaking on CNC3's The Morning Brew program. To some business news, the Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association is hoping that in government's upcoming mid-year budget review, the sector will be allowed to continue to recover. And there's a new environmentally friendly laundry detergent on the local market. Keisha Kalesa Alonso gives us the details in tonight's Business Watch. The Trinidad and Tobago Manufacturers Association is hoping that government's upcoming media budget review will continue to allow manufacturers to recover. In a statement issued earlier today, President Trisha Kusal says the TTMA wants government to continue to enable the sector to stabilize and expand its operations. And in doing so, Ms. Kusal adds the country can earn much needed foreign exchange. Additionally, the TTMA president is also welcoming the central bank's annual report, which notes an increase in productivity in the non-energy sector for the first three quarters of 2021. Manufacturers themselves are innovative, employing work-from-home solutions, more efficient shift systems, and a greater integration of technology in daily operations. This allowed for increased productivity despite the fewer man hours worked. However, Ms. Kusal says while there were declines in some sectors, the organization is working to address this. While there was an increase in most sectors, TTME notes the report to decrease, particularly in the printing and packaging, as well as textile and garment sectors. TTMA continues to pursue export markets for all sectors of manufacturing, including these two, as we resume physical trade missions. And Unilever is moving ahead with meeting its target of net zero carbon by 2030. This as a company has introduced its breeze dilutable liquid laundry detergent. And it is also easy on the pockets of consumers. You simply add water to a small amount of the detergent to wash multiple loads. The company's CEO, Jean-Marc Moutier, explained at a recent launch. He adds that the product is also friendly to the environment. In other business news, starting July 1st, 2021, customers traveling out of Kingston, Jamaica, now have more options with the introduction of service to Orlando, Florida from Caribbean Airlines. The non-stop return flights between Norman Manley International and Orlando International Airport will operate twice weekly on Monday and Thursday, Carl says. It adds that these flights are complemented by three weekly services between Kingston and Hollywood International Airport each Tuesday, Friday and Sunday. Chicola Salonzo, CNC3 Business Watch. Now to this, a Maloney woman is in police custody after swindling $46,000 from a commercial bank. Police say in October 2021, Nicolin Agarat presented a job letter and a pay slip in her name to the bank for a loan. The documents were deemed to be genuine and Ms. Agarat received $46,000. However, upon further verification, the documents were found to be false. Fraud squad officers later charged the 33-year-old. She was granted $150,000 bail and must reappear in court on May 22nd. Businessman Adrian Schoon and event promoter Shahid uh, Abdullah both plead not guilty to three charges over their alleged breach of the public health regulations last year. Schoon, the son of a government minister, and Abdullah are accused of hosting a party on Boxing Day last year in contravention 
of the then regulations. Most of the patrons of the event who were charged for gathering in a group of more than 10 also appeared in court. They too denied any wrongdoing. However, several of them did not make an appearance today as they were not properly summoned when charged in early March. During the hearing, the magistrate expressed hope that a prosecutor from the office of the DPP would be appointed to the cases by the next hearing so that she could set a trial date. The cases were adjourned to October 10th. Still to come in the news. With COVID cases spreading across schools, head of the pediatric department at Mount Hope calls on parents to be patient. Good Monday evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, it was a hot day, but maximum high temperatures only got up to around 31.5 degrees Celsius. But we did see some humid conditions drive that feels like temperature up to the 40s. So today would have been a day to walk with the water and sunscreen because mostly sunny skies prevailed. And we'll see more of that in the coming days, but we're also monitoring a tropical wave in the Eastern Atlantic. I'll have the details on what that means for Trinidad and Tobago coming up. Education Minister is reviewing a plan of action aimed at tackling school violence. Although Dr. Nian Gadsby-Dolly did not divulge details of a team appointed to look into the matter, she did confirm she was analyzing the report. Back in February, Dr. Gadsby-Dolly announced talks had been held with National Security Minister Fitzgerald Hines and Youth Development Minister Foster Cummings on how to deal with the scourge of school violence. Since the appointment of the Interministerial Committee to now, the Education Ministry says it has received over 20 reports of school fights. With growing concern over the spread of COVID-19 in schools, there's a call for parents to be a little patient. According to the head of the Pediatric Emergency Department at Mount Hope, historically, diseases have spiked at the start of the new school term. However, she says the spread of these diseases usually levels out as the term progresses. Rashad Khan has more. Every time when children go on holidays and then come back out to school, there is a spike we would see in the number of infections. According to Dr. Vidya Ram Charita Maraj, head of the Pediatric Emergency Department at the Eric Williams Medical Sciences Complex, this is a phenomenon that pediatricians have gotten accustomed to over the years. While COVID-19 is relatively new, the trend of increased infections isn't. Based on her experience with other diseases and the evolution of the coronavirus so far, she expects it to behave like the seasonal influenza. This means an ease in transmission will come in time. Most of the times in September, it would be basically the flu. And we would see it, they would have many cases, and then it would start settling down. She says some of the diseases that spread among children are influenza, hand, foot and mouth disease, chicken pox, and roseola. A mother herself, she says it's inevitable that children will contract COVID-19 at some point. It's a fact she's accepted for her son. It's not a matter of if he's going to get the infection, it's when and also how many times he's going to get it. With this in mind, she advises parents to prepare themselves for this eventuality. The reality is, is that children are going to get it. In most of the cases, the children are doing much better than the adults. But while Omicron may be milder, especially in children, she says vaccination will protect them against severe illness and could protect them from any other variants that may emerge in the future. It's why Dr. Mirage says she will be taking her son to get vaccinated. There's no confirmation yet on when vaccines for children between the ages of 5 and 11 will arrive in the country. As of the end of the second school week, there were 316 cases from 243 schools nationwide. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. It's now time for the weather forecast with Kaleen Hussein. And Kaleen, today felt like quite a scorcher. Right, and the numbers didn't actually reflect that. Both in Trinidad and Tobago, the maximum high came in at around 31.5 degrees. So far from the hottest day for the year. 
Um, but why would it feel so much warmer than the temperatures reflect? Right, so on a thermometer, that's the number that we see that temperature is outside. But what it feels like is something entirely different. It has to do with humidity, winds, and we're in a time of year where the winds will become dying down and we'll be seeing warmer temperatures all the way through October. So more hot days are on the horizon. But now let's take a look at what's in store for the weather forecast because today it was a hot and sunny day and we expect more of those days to come because out in the Atlantic we have lots of dry air, very mild Saharan dust. So that's good news for those that are sensitive to the dust. But something else we're also tracking, a tropical wave. It's the first one for the years. This cluster of clouds in the intertropical convergence zone. And it's forecast to get here across Trinidad and Tobago by Sunday into Monday. So that's this upcoming weekend. And once that wave moves across us here in the Caribbean and the Lesser Antilles, that will trigger the start of the wet season. So let's take a look at what exactly triggers that start. The passage of a tropical wave or even the intertropical convergence zone across Trinidad and Tobago. But these features must accompany rainfall or trigger rainfall and it needs to produce measurable amounts. Now the wet season generally begins on the first day of rains and this wetter than usual pattern will stick around all the way through December. And that includes the hurricane season as well. And something to remember, these early season tropical waves, not every single wave will bring rainfall. But now let's take a look at the weather forecast for us overnight tonight because mostly clear skies are in the forecast. We could see one or two spotty showers favoring Rio Claro and southeastern parts of Trinidad. But generally, we have dry, stable conditions across the country, so we expect dry and stable weather. And looking at the forecast for us tomorrow, it's really lots of sunshine across the country, mostly sunny starts of the day. Minimum low temperatures overnight tonight between 24 and 25, warming up to a scorching 33 degrees Celsius if that temperature verifies. Then tomorrow could be a contender for the hottest day for the year so far. We could see partly cloudy conditions across western parts of Trinidad during the afternoon. One or two isolated showers, but nothing too significant. Tomorrow is a day to walk with lots of water and sunscreen. And if you're heading to the beach, taking advantage of the sunny skies near calm conditions in sheltered areas, season open waters slight to moderate with waves up to 1.5 meters. And for those checking out the next couple of days, what weather you can expect, mostly sunny conditions for the next five days. So we're still getting a taste of the dry season. So back to you, Ria. What do you prefer, wet season weather or dry season weather? I'm tempted, I'm tempted to say that I prefer the season, whichever one has the ripe mangoes coming in, which <laughs> I understand may be the, the period between dry and wet season. The transitional months, yes. Yeah. So that's right now, actually, April into May. That's Correct. the transitional the trees months. trees are bearing, but you know, Colleen, I would much prefer the season that doesn't have as much impact on people. So I know flooding can be quite devastating. So yeah, I am a dry season person myself. I like a rainy day more, just as much as any other person, but the rains in the dry season doesn't usually bring floods. That's right. Thank you so much, Colleen. Let's tell you what's still to come in the 7 p.m. news. A woman who sold doubles for a living is celebrating her 100th birthday. We'll tell you what she ate for breakfast every morning. Welcome back. No date has been given, but the mayor of the capital city says wrecking will resume in the very near future. Joel Martinez says enforcing traffic regulations is just one aspect of law and order in Port of Spain. Mayor Martinez says steps are currently being taken to ensure that motorists have no excuses when it comes to indiscriminate and illegal parking. He says streets are being properly marked and signs are being erected to pave way for the resumption of wrecking. As we have met with the Ministry of Work, uh, Traffic Management Division, and uh, we have asked them to work out, let us work out uh, a program so that we can determine where needs the wrecking most, where we can, um, where we can, um, maybe we can phase it in. The mayor is hoping that homelessness will also soon be a thing of the past. He says while previous mayors have made efforts to address this concern, their efforts were met with resistance from street dwellers, with some even mounting legal challenges. But Martinez says a tripartite agreement among the Ministry of Social Development, a homeless assistance office, and the mayor's office will see the issues of street dwelling addressed. 
Retreating to some crime news, a domestic dispute in Carnage has left one woman dead and another woman detained by police. Stephanie Calbayo, a 32-year-old CPAP worker of Carnage, was on her way home when she was attacked. She was stabbed three times in the back and died at hospital. CNC3 News understands a mother of five made numerous complaints to police after several threats were made against her. The other woman is detained at the Carnage police station assisting with investigations. Stephanie's mother-in-law, Patricia Roberts Glasgow, told CNC3 News this afternoon that the attack was over her son, who is currently incarcerated. She said the police failed in following up on the matter despite numerous reports of threats and attacks. My son in trouble and Stephanie still living here with us. She wouldn't have any fa the family in Valencia, but that kid is a very violent person. She's a very violent person and she's been walking along with knife. Police are continuing investigations. Homicide investigators are trying to determine the circumstances that led to the death of a 55-year-old man in Laventille last evening. Officers were on patrol at around 11 p.m. when they received a report of a man lying motionless in a car on Pashley Street. Police went to the area and found the body of Richard Francis slumped over the steering wheel of his Nissan Wing Road. Francis's body bore no marks of violence. A post-mortem examination is expected to be performed later this week. And the relatives of 34-year-old Joseph Pear, who was shot dead in Santa Cruz last Friday, believes his death was due to envy. Pear was with friends outside of Minimart when they were ambushed by gunmen. Pear and another man, aged 32, were shot several times. Pear died on the scene, while the other man was taken to hospital, where he is warded in a serious condition. A relative told us that Pear's cousins suffered a similar fate seven years ago. They said that Joseph helped anyone in the area and he was not involved in any criminal activity. Pay had just completed building an apartment and was operating a vending stall. However, he closed down the business recently. Police are continuing with investigations. Acting Police Commissioner McDonald Jacob is calling the leak of a confidential police document about Government Minister Foster Cummings as unbecoming and unacceptable. Last Thursday, opposition Senator Jayanti Lachmidial produced a document alleging that the Youth Development Minister was the subject of a police investigation for land fraud and gang dealings. Claims Cummings has already denied. Speaking today, Acting Commissioner Jacob said there's a difference between intelligence and evidence. You know, it's very distasteful when you see confidential reports secret, like that secret documents. which is a, which are secret documents appearing in the public you know so i'm very very much concerned about that national security minister hines said the police will attempt to turn intelligence into evidence he said the government will not interfere in the police's attempts to do so a 39-year-old Arima man who caught his then-wife in a hotel room with another man has lost his malicious prosecution lawsuit over being charged in that situation. High Court Judge Frank Sipasa dismissed Ron Diaz's lawsuit earlier this afternoon after ruling that it was frivolous and vexatious. Justice Sipasad rules that the police had reasonable and probable cause to charge Diaz and there was no malice. The case stemmed from an incident at Hotel Normandy in St. Anne's in March 2016. Diaz claimed he dropped his then-wife at the hotel for a job. However, when he went to the room his wife was staying in, he found the man crawling out from under the bed. You can read more details about that case in tomorrow's Guardian newspaper. Welcome back to the 7 p.m. news. On the heels of Mother's Day, Micheline Elaine Scores is celebrating an even greater accomplishment. At her Marabella home, family and friends are ringing in her 100th birthday. Sasha Wilson and Ivan Tulsi were there, and they tell us what Micheline says is her secret to long life. Happy birthday to you. You have to go to church. Mm -hmm. You have prayer. Yeah. Uh, you pray for the whole world because yes. pray for the whole world, eh? Yes. Pray for everybody. Pray, yes, pray for everybody. And don't keep people in mind. Don't keep nobody in mind. 
and talk to Jesus. Yes. Jesus had to save him. Michelin Elaine Squires believes that lifestyle as well as hard work has allowed her to see her 100th birthday. Monday morning, 4 o'clock, I get up and I fry my foot away. I fry my um, um, double. My double. Yeah. I have my bed in China mm -hmm. and all the rest of it. And I walk up, Union Road up to, yes. and I said, the mother of four, grandmother of six, and great-grandmother of three lives at Batu Boulevard in Marabella, but she spent her childhood years in Las Lomas. In those kind of days, you have to obey your mother mm -hmm. and father and obey everybody. Mm -hmm. You go to school, you, the school wasn't far. You walk to school, you have to be very, very, very nice to the principal. While her first meal on the morning is porridge, she admits to having a sweet tooth. Tell them about the chocolate and the red mango. Yeah. <laughs> Tell them. You just yeah. know, oh, mom, you eat all of that. And the cheesecake yeah. where it's high and easy. Good yeah. Yeah. Her birthday was on Sunday, but on Monday, Social Development Minister Donna Cox and her team celebrated with her. She was presenting with a cake, a certificate of honor, and a food hamper. So we are calling all persons who are centenarians, so you have people who will be 100 soon, mm -hmm. and if they can register at the ministry, because at the ministry we only have persons who are on our pension, we would have their records. Mm -hmm. But if you're not on our pension system, then okay. we wouldn't have the records. And mm -hmm. so we are registering everyone, because we want everyone to be a part of this. Sasha Wilson, CNC3 News. Got to love her advice. Remember to pray for the whole wide world. Happy birthday, uh, Miss Gorez, from all of us here at CNC3. It's time to recap our headlines as we leave you. Massive manhunt underway for missing two-year-old boy. Search crews are still combing the Point Fortin area. National Security Minister admits crime situation horrendous but sees no reason to resign. That brings us to the end of the 7 p.m. news here on CNC3. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Ria Rambley. Have a good night. Thank you.